we have made it to episode seven, I believe it is, of the SBG podcast. And today we welcome Mr. JJ Savage. Welcome. How's it going, man? Thank you for coming. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Man, uh, so me and JJ go way back. JJ, aka Josh Darrell, for those who do not know. By my legal name. Yeah. So Josh and me played in a band together for, I think it was like 10 years, right? With God, when did we get started? Octane? Like, oh. Was it like, like 2010 or something like that? Yeah. I remember at old Kimbro's house, we were like just come our, like our our I former band that. Carry On had just disassembled in a uh, spectacular fashion, <laughs> and then we went yeah. and we were hanging out and we were like, man, we gotta figure out something that encapsulates the style of music that we want us. And we were like on the spot, we were like high octane for sure because we be were it. we were like obsessed with Steel Dragon at the yeah. time. We were like. That's the energy. That's the vibe we want. And that was the band, the song that we were trying to cover that ended up breaking the previous band up. So then it was fitting that we like made How the new one was that? out of the ashes. <laughs> yeah, man. And then with, uh, I can't remember which episode it was, but I was talking about how we played at the Wild Sam and we had George Cole and all that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. We were playing Asuka. with. Yeah. And uh, Chris Minta. Man. That show was super tight. Yeah, that was a good time. That was a wild show. Oh, yeah. That was fun. And now this man is playing for L.A. Rocks. How did he do that? The no. big leagues big these leagues. days. Yeah, big leagues. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's fun. We uh, we did a show last night in Opelousas. It was a private party, but um, it was fun. I thought you were out of state. No. No, no. That's We're in Beaumont on the 18th. Opelousas, you're al- you're lucky to be alive then, dog. <laughs> it's like North New Iberia. Everybody was strapped for that show just to be safe. <laughs> Dave LaPointe shot a couple rounds in the air just to like just to settle everybody down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we uh, did a little, little party out there. Um, week before that was Rock and Bowl. Rock and Bowl was crazy. Those uh, the pictures from that show look super tight. I think they said. I don't know what the pull was this time, but time before that was like like 800 plus. Damn. It was ridiculous. And that venue is set up in such a way that it looks great because it's got yeah. the two stories and the they got a balcony. balcony. Up top or like the suites up top. And then the yeah. freaking stage is in the middle of all these like bowling areas. So then it's just. Yeah, man. like literally like six bowling lanes on either side of you. So And tight. a huge dance floor in the, in the middle. It's pretty good. It's fun. And then. Um, the lineup yeah have you all gotten wells he's like in there he fills sometimes. in <laughs> he's like a jack of all trades mm-hmm. like if i can't make a show he'll come in and play bass if gabe can't make a show he'll come and play guitar out nah, of sight so, yeah. obviously he doesn't he doesn't do the keys or anything but he'll do just guitar or bass yeah. whatever he needs to do so wells uh was one of the original members of that band teddy van trixie yeah and whenever i played in that band briefly that's the position that i filled for like two shows on oh, that's three. right he wasn't in there it was you chris and andre yeah Nikki danger and blake and blacky was, velvet an interesting time for sure it was like <laughs> super spooky i got like a, a small taste of like what it's like to play with any ears to a big crowd like that yeah and it was Man, like you better not mess up <laughs> yeah or, or like the schedule is super tight right so oh, then yeah. you have like every song is lined up and so you got to know which guitars you're about to go for the tuning so then there was one instance where you know, I, I was like panicking because I had like three three weeks to learn like thirty songs or something like I that. I remember you telling me about that sitting at work trying to hammer these songs oh out. My God. And then so you know, you get up there and you're trying to figure it all out. Some of the songs I'd never played with them until we were like practicing on stage at the casino before the damn show. And so then there was Which one your, your rehearsal before the show yeah. sound check. <laughs> yeah. So then there was one song that while we were playing in, in front of the crowd, uh, the one of them ended and then the other one started up, and it was like. A guitar change, all this stuff, and, and I thought didn't it was realize gonna... it. Well, no, I was like, man, I was panicking because I was like, oh shit, this is like requiring a, a big change, and this is like about to start up. So I was like, wait a minute, what are you doing? And Blake was just like, you gotta get off the fucking stage and get the, get the <laughs> you guitar. Better, you better know when the song is getting ready to end, <laughs> yeah. so you can walk off stage while it's ending oh, to switch man. because they're rolling songs, man. It's so crazy. Yeah, they... But like now that you're like, you've been doing how long have you been in LA Rocks now? Uh, since 2016. So I don't do math. Eight so years. eight years, yeah. 
bro. That's that's pretty yeah. tight, man. When you think Nine about years, it, yeah. That's, that's, that's probably longer than Andre was a bass player in there for, right? I think so. Yeah, I think Chris is the man. only one who's actually been in the band longer than like anybody. He joined in 09. You got, He's been in the band for almost 20 years. <laughs> you got almost as much tenure now as him mm-hmm. in there. That's I'm sick, man. There. Yeah, Chris. That'd be that'd be a cool uh, interview if he ever wants to come on. Chris, if you're watching this, bro, just hit me up if you want to come on, man. <laughs> Fun stuff, man. I'm doing it. I All think, the cool kids are doing it. I think I remember... Either he had just started or he was like about, he was like trying out for LA Rocks. And I remember hanging out. It was like a birthday party or something whenever we might have been like just out of high school. And we were at the bowling alley by Hooters. And we were like in my truck oh, yeah. jamming a poison song. And he was just like vibing out to that shit. So it's like so ironic that <laughs> he'd be singing that shit, you know, for a, for a living these days. And that's what he does. That's what we do. It's pretty tight. So then you got the LA Rocks thing going on, which is pretty massive. And then also you got, you're working for your dad. At, doing the printing thing. Yeah. Rail mail and imaging. Hell yeah. If you need some printouts. That's right. You need a sign. I got you. Hit them up. Got you covered. Because after all, this is, you know, any endeavors you got, this is the place to plug it. So it's the place, man. Yeah. We used to jam uh, exclusively at. God, yeah. In the back of the shop. In my office, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a wild time, man. We we used to jam in there before we tore the walls out, and then after. Like it's been a long time <laughs> that we've been back there. Oh yeah. And then remember when you got <laughs> you got the uh, was it like the little mover light? Yeah. <laughs> we had it plugged up on like one of the printers in the back, and it was just that moving shit around. Was so tight. We had like a traffic light or something that would just go. Was that what you had? Like it was like, it was like the yellow, multi. green, uh-huh. red. <laughs> it it actually transformed it into like almost like a nightclub thing because we had all of our like we were drinking those um what is it the apple the, the, the reds apple. <laughs> No, it was like the Wicked we, Apple or some shit. There was like the twelve percent ones that were like oh, this big, uh, but they were twelve yeah, percent. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. it was almost like or like Mike's Hard Lemonade, but the harder lemonade yeah. or like Red's Apple or Ale. Or so you only needed like one. Yeah, and like one of these would bitch. trash you. And yeah. so we were chugging those, playing with all the lights off and all this shit in the back of like a mailing room. <laughs> like one little mover doing this. That shit was so sick. Yeah, that was good stuff. That was a good time. And then the uh, the mark on the back of the wall where the uh, where you got your infamous scars from on the that hand was on the door, yeah. <laughs> you can't really see it, but yeah, that was like scar of shame that I must bear. We were freaking like tracking the high octane album, and he was like, "Bro, <laughs> I got bad news, bro." <laughs> well, wait, funny story with that too. Okay, you remember back then, I was looking for more musician work, so I joined up with a little country chick Nicole yeah. in Abbeville so I had rehearsed with her and her band for like six months like every Wednesday for like four hours a night from like six o'clock to ten o'clock at night like all 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 the time and uh, we finally she finally scheduled a video shoot to do like a promo video so they we went to this venue um, in Abbeville somewhere I couldn't tell you what it was we had the stage set up and she filmed, we played a couple songs when she filmed it and she was going to cut a little promo video for it for booking and stuff like that. The next day I broke my hand. <laughs> so I had to call and I was like, yeah, uh, probably that. shouldn't book anything right now. Cause, uh, <laughs> I'm not able to play. I completely shattered my bone in half and like <laughs> tore up some of the little, I don't know what they're called, little bones in your wrist, like in the oh, hand. Yeah. I broke one of those, broke the big bone right here. The metatarsals. Yeah, whatever the hell it's called. Carpals or whatever, <laughs> metacarpals. Little gravel bones in your hand. <laughs> um, had to have two pins and a plate and four screws. But look, he powered through doing the album, even with all that bullshit. I think you had like a sling on and all kind of bullshit and had, you still were like, it was wrapped. Yeah, I had it wrapped because I had two pins with a little hook on the end sticking out of them. And I, I distinctly remember being at Justin's house. And that well, was at actually Luke's house when yeah. he was living upstairs. In the apartment and we were record- I was tracking bass. And I remember kind of like I had to keep my hand just so like, stiff. So I'm playing like this instead of like this. It's like this. Oh, and I remember shit. at one point, like I went to hit a note up like that. And those hooks caught on the string. And I oh, felt it pull. It just God. <laughs> absolutely excruciating but hey we did it yeah man 
And you still got the Dankenstein poster up there. So. I need to make shirts out of that. I still shit. have the Behemoth poster in my house somewhere that Joe did. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to post a picture of this one so people can see. Yeah. Shout out to Joe. Ogre <laughs> Joe. He did some amazing work for the man, the, the myth, art. the legend. Yeah. Whatever happened? Did you still have that other one we did? The album cover with the skull and the wings? I thought that you had it. I might still have that one. I don't know. That's probably in the storeroom in the back. We like always talked about making t-shirts with the with the Dangenstein ones too. I can like imagine Never that did. purple would be tight on like oh, a black. black shirt. Yeah. Maybe one of these days. A <laughs> limited edition. <laughs> So, man, we have collectively between us, we have a fair amount of stories of band escapades, and we could get into the high octane ones, but are there any cool, you know, tight uh, LA Rocks ones that you'd like to share? It could be a whole <laughs> range from like, you know, tightest show that you've played with like another big band that you'd never thought that you'd be rubbing <sighs> elbows with. Or That's the thing with LA Rocks, I've never really got to play with other bands. Now, before I joined, they played, they did the district with Brett Michaels. That's tight. I, I didn't get to do that one. I wasn't with him at that point. Um, they also did the 80s weekend with like Night Ranger. Night Ranger, yeah. Um, and Wells got to meet like Brad Gillis and all them, which was super sick, but I didn't, I wasn't part of that. Um, tightest show I played was Patty in the Park. And, oh, like right yeah. before COVID. There was the year, but well, I say right before, the year before COVID. And we were supposed to come back the next year and we were booked. And then, I think this was 2020, because it's 2019. Yeah, yeah 2020 early is when it started. There. Um, I mean, like, it was Thursday. We were supposed to play, like, Friday. Thursday afternoon. <laughs> I was walking out of the office, and I got the text message, Hey, man, Patting the Park's been canceled. Like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was the downward spiral. Just everything was canceled after that. But the yeah, Patting the Park the year before that was monstrous. Because it was like, how many people do you think were there? Like, oh, easily 4,500 people. A sea of people. If you have a, a picture. I have, a, I have the picture. It's on one of my Instagram, too, I can send you. Um, yeah, we'll post that up right here. I mean, so it was like, see. you literally walk out and just, as far as you could see, just people. Like, whenever you started playing music and you were, like, trying to get up to anywhere near that level, did you ever think that you, you nah, know? I mean, I've. it's one of those things where, like, you tell yourself like that's the dream man i want to play to that but you have to accept in the back of your mind that like it's kind of not even a 50 50 because especially in today's day and age where like anybody can make music there's that little chance that you'll get to play those big shows but you always you, you hold strong you oh, know yeah man man and chris and i were talking about that not long ago you know playing shows like that or playing rock and bowl shows to 850 people like we're sitting there thinking like if you would have told yourself in high school that you're getting ready to walk out on stage and play this big of a crowd yeah and they're all there to see you and they love seeing you like i never would have believed it it's it's got to be like every time you walk out it's just like you, you see all that shit and you're like holy shit this is like actually happening again it's yeah there's still like the tinge of the nerves <laughs> before you get out there like the first couple of songs just sound awful to you because you're freaking out and uh, you finally get three or four in like all right cool everything's good Get a few shots in on stage, kneeling down while they pour One, liquor two. down your throat. <laughs> Wait, that, that's, a, that's a story. Okay. We played the Burton Coliseum in Lake Charles a couple weeks. I say a couple weeks ago. Good Lord, it's been a while, like six weeks ago, um, for the Rabbit Festival. And when we do our poison medley, we do uh, I Want Action. And there's a little breakdown you know, in the song where Brett talks, whatever he does. Um but I just keep rolling out the baseline and Chris will talk to the crowd. And like I said, we'll do that shtick where like, I'll keep playing, but I'll get on my knees and keep playing and tilt my head back. And Chris will pour a shot in my mouth. And usually it's a shot, a shot. <laughs> well, this time he was overzealous on this oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> this time. So <laughs> now, obviously there's no outside liquor into the show that they know of. <laughs> uh -huh. So one of my friends I'm gonna leave names out. One of my friends, brought his wife and the kids and everybody and he had this like bluey sippy cup full of crown blueberry or whatever that new crown is that has been sold out like crazy oh, that's awesome um, he was like yeah man i got you i brought you guys some cool so he hands it to us and it's, it looks so stupid because we're a bunch of like dudes in costume on stage and then chris is walking around with a bluey cup a little cartoon dog on the that's top awesome. and he couldn't figure out how to get this thing to work at because i don't know if it was like a sippy cup straw thing where you have to like press it down yeah, like bite the straw or press it down or something like that so we finally just yanked the top off and i was like all right yeah you just use that 
and he got a little overzealous and just thought when I said yeah use that he thought I meant pour the whole thing oh. and this is like a, a six ounce bottle oh like it's it's not not a shot glass it's a kid's like it was a multiple glug. Bottle. Yeah. <laughs> so he's sitting there pouring it. In my head, I'm just thinking, oh, please, God, stop. Stop. Literally. And it got to the liquor. point, like, literally, like, I'm, and I'm like, just, there's tons of people in the crowd, and they're screaming, man, because it's, that's so cool. Open it up. I'm like, oh, my God, don't be a bitch. Just do it. <laughs> but it got to the point where, like, I couldn't do it anymore, and it just, like, volcano bubble, just, <laughs> <laughs> all down my face in my eyes all over my guitar like, get to my eyes I'm just <laughs> screaming because it's like lava in you my can't face stop in playing. my nose and everything and I'm just like keep playing oh my god oh yeah in fact we got to rock and bowl after that and then I pulled my, my guitar out of the vault and it was like I could slap my hand on the on the body and just like raise Stick. it up. It's yes. like syrup, just dried syrup on there. Oh man! It took me like fifteen minutes to clean that thing off. I'm pretty sure that's how my damn uh, wireless little box that I had in that like army tote mm-hmm. thing got all sticky like that because I st- I never used it just because it was like I could never clean it off because it nope. was freaking so sticky from liquor. Yep, and I'll do that now. We're like. We do that shot thing, but I'll save just like that much of it in my mouth and I'll spit it out like a big plume. That's awesome. It's just like, it's cool, but if you don't close your eyes, it all comes back down into your face. Yeah. It's like I get up and my eyes are bloodshot red. I'm like, ah, ah. <laughs> Triple H style. <laughs> yeah, that hurts. Damn, that's tight. It looks cool, but I don't necessarily recommend it. <laughs> Leave it to the professionals. So, uh,. That's that's a, that's an excellent story from the current <laughs> days. Now, as far as like rubbing elbows with uh, some m- big hitters in the industry, we did that. We played uh, with a couple in high octane, man. Yeah, man, which it was pretty cool. We can go into that a little bit, oh, starting yeah. with the uh, old uh, Kill Devil Hill. Oh, I thought you were gonna go further back to Southern Whiskey Rebellion. Southern Whiskey. Remember Who that was in that one though? That was whenever we played Kill at the Devil station. Hill. Then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Southern, Southern Whiskey, Whiskey Re- we played with White Light and Southern Whiskey Rebellion. They they were like in that Delta Doom show, right? With um, with didn't they play with Texas Hippie at uh, yeah. the station like, a long time ago? God, I miss that venue. Yeah, it's all a blur these days. But I, I know for sure I remember Kill Devil Hill. That show was because like... we had yeah Vinny Apice from Dio. He played drums for Dio. That was the Black Sabbath years with Dio. He was playing yeah. the drums for like, and so yeah. then I I had heard that before we played that show, but I didn't like understand. Like, I realized ne- just it didn't click exactly yeah. who he is because I never really listened to much of those albums. I only ever listened to the the Ozzy ones, and then after we played that show, I ended up listening to a fair <laughs> amount of the Dio ones, and I was like, holy shit, this dude was like great, and I really wish that I would have known, you know, done my homework yeah. enough to freaking like. And ask I did him enough to that. know who he was. And then, man, I just remember being outside and that tour bus rolls up. Yeah. First off, the tour bus rolling up alone was just sick. Mouths agape. Just so cool. <laughs> and then Vinny gets off the tour bus and doesn't go inside. He doesn't just, you know, cover his head. He walks straight up to me and you and I think maybe one of the crew guys that was loading in or something. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? I'm Vinny. I was just like, yes. oh! It was like aliens nice came down. You. But it was when Rex Brown came in. That's when everybody's freaking brains melted like Pantera <laughs> just walked in to Grant Street basically oh my god that was wild man. I wish that Rex would have been as social as the rest of them but still to be able to see him up close like that was yeah. super tight be in the it, same building and not like separated by barricades and security guards or like a festival or something yeah. like he's just there and I mean didn't he hang out for a little bit after the show mm-hmm. I remember Take some pics yeah people were giving him stuff and taking pictures and stuff and then it was crazy, too, because it wasn't, like, a super-packed venue, so it was a pretty intimate show, and that was even better. I mean, just... Which is crazy. I don't think people realize who exactly was playing. Because, I mean, Kill Devil Hill, I think, was new at the time. Yeah. So, like, they, they don't realize, like, guys, it's Dio and Pantera are in, in this building right yeah. here. Unbelievable. <laughs> and nobody showed up. I mean, I say nobody showed up. Not as many people as you would expect yeah. showed up. And we, we got our uh, little chance to sign our names on the Grant oh, Street yeah. back wall and eat some gumbo really with those legends there. and shit. That was a good time. And, and we, then we did um, 
we did that show at we did a handful of good shows at uh sam's place sam's like, and the salmon yeah yeah saliva we we played with them I forgot about that and then saving abel we played with them too yeah and that uh metallica cover was... band oh yeah one that's like the only one that's actually endorsed by metallica yeah yeah they look very much like if i squinted the front man would look just like like Hetfield. much thinner like mm-hmm. a lankier james Hetfield. but yeah that was crazy Oh, so we, we've played with, okay, so Saliva and Saving Abel. I feel like there's probably one that we're missing. I can't remember. We played remember. with that Otherwise Bandit. Um, yeah, Otherwise. That was really like tight. Like got real big. Otherwise was like, mm, kind of on the same level as Saving Abel. They're, yeah, they had that like modern rock. Mm-hmm. They were cool though. The brother and the two brothers, the singer and the guitar player. They were really cool. Oh, they pulled us up on stage to jam with them too. Remember that? Because we remember. sang, because it was, all right, you had the singer there's the bass player and the guitar player. There was two guitar players, the brother with the long hair and the other guitar player. I think he like short or spikier hair or something like that, but mm-hmm. he pulled us up on stage and we were singing. I, man, I wish I still had that picture. It's on there. It's on Facebook Jeez. or something somewhere. I know. Yeah. We do have a picture with them after the show. Yeah. That was yeah. man. The station. I definitely missed that, that venue. Such a good venue. We had some high highs and low lows across the, uh, the couple of my bands. That was that episode that I did with Justin. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about, yeah, the Fear Factory show, like that one show, man. Oh, boy, that one show. <laughs> I, remember, <laughs> I wasn't even uh, in the band that I felt the pain of that. <laughs> I remember, like, after that one, you know, it was, it was there was so much hype for that one. And, I mean, we covered it in, the la- in that last episode I did. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of hype for it. And then they ended up very much not going to plan because of one of the members uh, at the time did not <laughs> fulfill. Not named. Yeah, didn't fulfill his role very well because he had other <laughs> things on his mind. But I remember after the show, it was a clear botched show. And, um how with that, the potential to be so big, dude. Yeah, the drummer got off the stage and he was like... <laughs> Hey, he talked to, to a couple of the bartenders, and then he talked to Justin, and he was like, "Hey, man, those bartender chicks said we suck, oh, bro." Isn't that so funny. <laughs> yeah, and Justin's like, just <laughs> <laughs> no, man. It's not funny. <laughs> Justin, I like... poured my literal life into this work, <laughs> and Justin like walked pretty much out of sight. We didn't see him for a couple yeah. hours, just chain smoking in a tar, vanished into the darkness. <laughs> yeah, I felt so bad. Oh man. Yeah, that was hilarious. Oh, uh, what, what a night! <laughs> and then me, we played with Banshee. Remember that? At uh, that's where we met George because he yeah. was he filled in for um. I can't remember. Cut for time here. What the hell's that dude's name? Tommy Flood, I think. Tommy Flood, the singer. I'm, I or Blackie Lawless. I remember y'all talking about him, right? Didn't y'all? Or... Blackie Lawless is Wallace, but. Yeah, I think I think yeah, I'm, didn't he like Flood. Ta- I'm telling you, I think that's the singer for the old singer for Banshee. Yeah, okay. No, um, and then Terry Dunn was the the like original guitar player for them. He's the only original member left. Was he the bass player at the time for that? He was a guitar player. He had the bandana and like the curly red hair. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember now. Yep. He came up to me after the show and he was like, "Hey, man, we need a bass player. Like, would you be interested?" And then damn, that's right. I'm stupid. <laughs> I'm stupid. I was like, I don't know, man. High Octane's taking off pretty good right now. Like, I don't know if I have time for it. Well, they were based out of Texas. Like, Oklahoma. Like, South Oklahoma. Yeah. And, like, you just need to come up to Oklahoma from rehearsals. And I was like, man, no. Uh I was like, dude, I'm, like, 21 years old. I have no, like, I'm not. (laughs) Will y'all fly me up there so that I can practice? It was just the logistics of that wouldn't have worked with my, like, having a full-time job and bills. There's just no way I could have made that work. Yeah. I wish I would have. Looking back on it, but man, it is, uh, what it is. And then all of those shows, we had Austin Pinkerton doing sound for us, I believe, or most of them. What did he do? Remember? Where did he do sound like it? Sam's? He was at the Salmon. I think he might have done sound. Oh, Salmon, that's right. Yeah, he was doing a lot of stuff at the Salmon. Do you know what he's doing these days? Yeah, with like Anthrax and Guar. Yeah, and... He's like on tour with the yeah. Pantera Zach Wild combo right now. Is he really? Or he was. I know I saw him with Anthrax recently, but I know I've, I guess I've seen him doing other stuff yeah, like that. That's pretty freaking bonkers. wild. And uh, uh, Austin, I mean, yeah, Austin, if you uh, feel like coming, you know, to Lafayette one of these days and you're around town and you want to come and do an episode, bro, just hit me up, man. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be a cool episode. <laughs> just pick his brain on right. all that shit. I just love hearing, like, all the, the stories, right? Because, yep, like, the these road. days I'm like... 
you know, doing the farm thing. So I've been out of the loop on the live music thing, but like so much crazy shit. It's it's like you just never know nope. what is gonna happen. Nope. Like y'all have played and it's the road travel time too. You know, you end up like like what's the furthest show y'all have played recently? Does it does well, it beat the Oklahoma uh, show that we played the yeah, time to get there? <laughs> Look, man, <laughs> nothing beats that spark show. Okay, I posted pictures and shit did of you that really? on, on the last episode. I did. Did yeah, you have to we censor were... a lot of things on that? Well, it was blurry enough to, uh, you know, but I, ta- <laughs> I talked about it. It was it was pretty cool. Yeah, there's okay. <sighs> Distance wise, yeah, because we played in uh, Louisville, Kentucky for Kentucky Derby Day. Man, that's tight. Yeah, you say that. <laughs> Wasn't that tight, bro. Wasn't that cool. So he had done a run where we went to Prattville, Alabama and played this place called the Blue Iguana, which was, the venue was sick. When I tell you how like a two-story stage, it wasn't like there's a stage with a really tall riser. There was a stage with a riser and then like six feet up was another like cubby stage. Well, and looking back on it, I don't know that it was actually a stage, but we used it as one. <laughs> like at one point, we climbed up there. We were jamming up there. Oh, that's tight. Um, and then we, the next morning, we got up and drove to Kentucky to play the Derby. And everybody kept telling us, like, oh, it's going to be wild, man. Everybody parties for the Derby, blah, 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 blah. Nobody told us that everybody parties for the Derby during the day and then goes home at night. Nobody parties Derby night. So we played Saturday... Or something like that. Friday night was apparently slammed. Or maybe we played a Sunday. Because it was supposed to be Derby weekend. So it was supposed to be like a whole weekend of things going on. But anyway, we played this. I don't. I couldn't even tell you the name of the bar. I don't remember. Um, we played this big venue that was supposed to hold probably seven to 900 people. And we, pl- we played that show to like 15 people. Ah, and yeah. like four of them were our crew guys. <laughs> The glorified practice. Yeah. I know it all too and well. It, but it was one of those that, like, we expected such a huge turnout. So the intro rolls and we're backstage and we run out. And it's like, yeah. And it's like nobody here, like, oh, this is going to be a three hour show to, you know, three oh, people and their kids. Hell yeah. Which was not. So, like, yeah, man, we drove all the way to Kentucky. We got to play in Alabama and then Kentucky, but it was it was hard. <laughs> it was hard to do that. So, people that don't play music, um, the the stories of shows, just that lifestyle, you know, going all these shows so different each time, and like you get the good ones that you that you like looked forward to, and then they were good. Then you have the shows that you look forward to, they were bad. You have the the ones that you counted them out immediately, and then they were actually pretty awesome. Those shows are pretty tight. Uh, I remember. There's a series of two shows that we did that are connected by actually, yeah, I think that, so. We played at the uh, what was it that place like right outside of like Mandeville or something? Whenever we played at that trailer, basically, that was like it was like a double wide trail. This is where we first you're talking about high octane, yeah. Whenever we played with Axes of Evil and I think Bad Grass on that same... That's how we met the Bad Grass. Yeah, the Babylon. Babylon. Right outside of Metairie. So, I'm not sure if they're still open. I say it's a double-wide trailer. I'm not it talking was... down on it because some of the tightest venues are just oh, yeah. in conspicuous places like that. And it, this was, show... it was a very small venue. Yeah. like. But the way that it was set up, you would expect that the bands would have been... Since it's like a shotgun-style building, you would think the bands would have been at the very end and the bar would have been right here because it pretty much was like double-wide trailer style. I remember this. It was... The bar was on this left side of the building and then right like three or four feet from... Like a three... Like a yard (laughs) of space between the singer and the barred stools. And that's where the the bands were set up and you were just getting blasted from behind if you weren't facing them or you just... (laughs) There was no opting out of the music if you were at that venue that night. (laughs) And it it had a decent crowd for, you know, for For the place it was and all that stuff. And then we played with some of the tightest bands that I'd heard. Bad grass, man. Adam Age. I forgot about that. I was jamming that shit uh, the other day. Giovanni Nova and all them boys. I still miss remember guys, y'all. Man. And uh um, <laughs> with the drummer <laughs> Did he wear that like brown potato sack? Uh, that was so, his like yeah. stick at some point. I remember that. <laughs> and um 
Axes of Evil, super they fucking were tight band. So good. Super tight. Um, but God, so that's so long ago. that's how we met them, and uh, I think we played a show with Axes of Evil again. They were like their guitar work, and I, think I mean they played the drummer, at the station or something like that. Again. Yeah, and they were the, solid. Yeah, it was great, and uh, so then we ended up uh, hitting it off with Bad Grass, and we talked to them, and then like months later, <laughs> <laughs> I know we're going, I know you're going with this one. <laughs> we, oh, went, no. <laughs> we went and we were playing. I had scheduled a show. Daiquiri at Supreme. Daiquiri Supreme. So previous to all, like in between these two shows, we had played at Daiquiri Supreme on Johnson Street. And that was one of those venues where that was like one of the biggest venues we played as high octane to, to date. And we were like stoked about it. The show that we played went very well. I think, did we play with somebody else or we, we were the play, only No, ones? we did. We played with... It was... Uh, that it, it was Apollo's Crows and... Pearl Jam tribute, but they do. Yeah. Oh my God! I can't remember I'm, I'm the names. I'm drawing a blank now. We played with them a handful of times as different bands. But they though. play. Yeah, that night was like their Pearl Jam tribute that we yeah. did. Yeah, I remember that. And so then we were. I think we were the headliners. Yeah, that was the, the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so then we played last. But we, you know, it was a really was a great, great show. show. Everybody enjoyed it. The house was packed. So then the owner liked us, and then. They were like, yeah, we want to have you back. So then I scheduled a show where we were the headliners again, and then we would only have one other band on the on the They bill. asked us to bring somebody. Yeah. So, so we then did. I was like, all right, I got a band in mind. We're going to get bad grass up in this bitch. From New Orleans. And, you know, my sense of, like, judgment for bands, uh, like, genre is, is muddy these days. <laughs> because, like... <laughs> You know, you, you play with all these bands, and what is considered metal and what's considered rock ends up getting like blurred. Yeah, pro- after promoters time. consider one genre something, and us band members consider it something else. You know? Yeah, it's like okay, is Three Days Grace rock? Is uh, Amon Amarth just metal? Is it yep. death metal? You know. So then, I was like, okay, these guys are rock, like it's us, like hard rock. Yeah, like- but they leaned apparently more on the side of metal which i was news to me sounded great you know whatever so then we get there and uh <laughs> they rolled up and well, they were late too because they it took what usually is like maybe a two hour or so drive it took them like four and a half hours to get from new orleans yes. to lafayette because they got the stuck traffic. in traffic on the basin or something like that and they were having issues and like they were just not in a good mood when they showed up rent spent money rented a u-haul oh, yeah. Rented the trailer and everything. Gas money, food money, getting so all the way there. They showed up and, and set up. <laughs> and uh, so then, you know, they're they're a little bit late, obviously, from that. So then everybody's, like, already on edge, pressed for time. And, like, for some reason, the people that I was in liaison with that were putting the show on with the actual venue were only going through me to talk to these people like bad grass and i was like bro like I, why i hate being the middleman yeah like that's like not that. our responsibility like we got you the band we sent them to you and i remember this i'm not gonna i'm not gonna name names yeah but, i remember the promoter and the booking guy was in, t- in touch with you and you said here's the guys and he, he sent them back he sent back and was like they sound great can't wait to see the show yeah. well it turns out he never actually listened to the music yes because man, these guys got on stage and they started sound checking. Just and sound checking. They didn't get through one song, and the venue was like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, they can't play here." And so, like, they just kept playing, and they literally shut the power off. So, leading up to that, though, they they were, they were sound checking, and then the guy who I was in touch with for promoting was like, "Okay, the head owner said if these guys keep playing, they're gonna shut them down, and also y'all could never play here again." Yeah, they're gonna borrow us from the venue if and we let like, these guys open the, the show. What the fuck is this? Like, this isn't our responsibility, man. Yeah, and I was like all hy- hyped up because it was actually happening, and then I'm not about to go and tell these dudes. Like, sorry that they guys, can't you made a play. trip for nothing because you're just too heavy. <laughs> yeah. So then I was like, I'm not telling them that shit, and then they kept playing, and they were like, "Okay, well, look." They'll cut them some slack if uh, they just don't play heavy shit. Like, what do you want them to unplug? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you surf know, music at that point. You got a damn set list. It's the set list is what you play in. It's not like it's you all can original just, like, music. Fucking plug in real quick behind your head, you know, a, a Matrix style and learn some smooth <laughs> jazz Matrix. real quick. So then they obviously stuck to what they were doing, and then they got progressively heavier as their songs and I continued. I think at one point they probably got heavier and heavier because they On told purpose. them not to. Yeah, yeah. and like it was louder and, louder and louder and louder. <laughs> and we were in the crowd like egging them on too, <laughs> like oh, just do it. <laughs> and they fucking were just letting it go at the end of it, and then they just like 
killed the lights and the sound. Well, it was you know. great that they didn't stop either. They just kept playing. <laughs> like the guitars like... and the bass cut off, but the drummer just kept going, and the singer kept screaming over everything. I Let me tell you, I was not in a good mood that night. Yeah. I almost punched that promoter right in his face. That man was very ready for that show. And, like, <laughs> I remember... We were in the parking lot, and I was just... I was seething angry with that dude because like, he made us look stupid too oh yeah and like the guys in bad grass were our friends and he pissed them off man they were not happy oh, so yeah. that promoter comes walking through the parking lot and I saw him and I made a beeline to him ready to swing on this dude it's like I'm coming out here and I'm sick and everybody's fucking sick <laughs> and you're all supposed to only care, play bro. <laughs> you know that you were supposed to play like 46% cover it was like some weird percentage yeah like <laughs> Need you to play so. one and a half cover songs. <laughs> no, man, we were never told that. You told us to find a band, and we did. Man, that, that was, was a hell of a night. Was that the same night? Was that high speed chase, or was yes. that the LA? That was, that was the same. That was the night. same night. So we're in the park. <laughs> we're in the parking lot, getting ready to beat the crap out of this promoter dude, <laughs> and all of a sudden. This pickup, like, utility truck, <laughs> contractor utility truck or something. It was like a tow truck. Was it really? I think so, yeah. I and thought it like, was like one of those, like, with the, the toolboxes up on the side and, like, a rack been. on the top. It was yeah. either a tow truck or, like, a utility truck. I don't remember what it was. But you could hear him coming down the road, like, Sirens, pedal to the metal, kind full of shit throttle, comes screeching into the parking lot, pulls around back, and we look up and we're like, what the hell is this dude driving, like, crazy? And then, like... All of Lafayette PD is behind this dude, screeching in from all sides. This guy rolls up and parks like right behind our cars and gets out and starts trying to hide and like run through the parking lot. Well, look, when he 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 rolled up before the cops got involved, which was only like a minute after he rolled up. He, wild. He parked super fast, got out of his truck, and sprinted to this nearby crowd of people that was just hanging out casually and tried to just like blend <laughs> in. Some Assassin's Creed just. <laughs> And the fucking cops They got up. that dude so quick. <laughs> he ain't fooling nobody, bud. The whole crowd turned to look at this dude. Like He's right here. What is this, this guy? Im- imposter in our midst. <laughs> that was a wild night. Oh, I forgot man. about that high-speed chase. Oh, did I tell you about that? Okay, speaking of high-speed chases, last year, Ellie Rocks got booked at the Wildcatter in Houston. Um, I think it was the second time we played there. So we're driving, getting into Houston. I'm terrible with highway mm-hmm. names when it comes to that area. But we're just driving, you know, we're all chilling. And I think somebody, we were talking about how traffic had already been bad. And we're thinking, like, what else could possibly go wrong with this road trip? You know, like, what what's next? A plane's going to land on the interstate or something? Or fall out of the sky? Like, <laughs> what could possibly hold us up next? And when I tell you this little like Nissan Altima or something came flying like 120 miles an hour, almost took my rear view mirror out on my right side. Like drove past me so fast that my SUV shook. Damn. I was like, what the hell? And I look in the rear view and I'm not, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like 15 or 20 cops are behind this dude and they are flying. I was like, what the hell? And we realize like they're chasing this dude. So I kind of pull over and man, they all spread out onto the interstate and block the whole interstate. Dude, the dogs get out there, out there with rifles and everything. And they've got this thing. Just, Damn. just they're aiming him down, dude. And we're sitting there like, shoot him. <laughs> pull the trigger. The collateral damage was fucking sky high. You understand? A but hail like, of we're bullets. We're talking about like what else could possibly happen. Like we can't. There's no way we get stopped on the interstate again. And then some dude, I don't know, like he kidnapped somebody or stole a car. He led the cops on a high speed chase, and they were not yeah. playing games. He ended up in the ditch, and they had him at gunpoint with the dogs and everything. I was like, man, you've already stopped this. You might as well kill the dude now. Yeah. Damn, that reminds me of that freaking time. I mean, tangents galore right here, but that's what it's about, man. Story time. It is story time. And um, I I remember, uh, not band related, but I was on the way back whenever we were living behind um, River Ranch. And I was like, I think I had taken off work early or something like that. We were going to try and see a movie. Yeah. And. I'm on Collie's, about to take a left at those apartments behind River Ranch, the condos. And I see a bunch of cops coming towards me on the left side of the road, just like a lot. 
all the sirens and lights and you. shit. And I'm like, oh, wow, something must be going down. And then out of nowhere, coming out of a parking lot, okay, at like probably 50 miles an hour, this black SUV smash, like goes through a fucking red light. Cause I had the green, the opposite side of green, and there was like a white pickup truck, like full size truck coming through, and this SUV T bones <laughs> this white truck to laugh. into oh it's it's crazy man <laughs> <laughs> he T bones him into a light pole, and like the light pole is damaged, big ass like hanging over truck is like smoking this you know unfolding before me this scene, and, and it looks like a movie, it feels like a movie. I'm like holy shit, that's a Man, what are the chances, you know? The good thing they got these cops rolling up. That's crazy that they would just have a wreck right here. And, like, you know, what are the odds? Yeah, and then, like, it never occurred to me what the fuck was happening. And then, like, these two dudes that looked like very undesirable fellows, super tatted up, like, looked a gang-affiliated, uh, you know, no no uh, shade on anybody tatted up, but you know the, the type of, like, gang activity type person, yeah. right? And uh, they roll out of both sides. Standing members of society. Yeah, like didn't look like they would own this vehicle right here. And then they <laughs> both roll out of the vehicle and just start sprinting across the parking lot. Like, and, oh, wait, now it's starting to add up. Yeah, and then this cop, like all these cops pull up, and one dude comes out with his, he's got his AR-15 sprinting across. And I'm like, well, like they, they – I'm spr- about to watch somebody get it. <laughs> they were so close to my vehicle, I probably could have, like, bumped the dude with my truck to, like, help the cops out. But, you know, I was like, I don't want any fucking part of it. I, don't wanna, I just <laughs> no want to go about my, my day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so then the cops and these dudes run off, and I don't – you know. And so then – I, I like pull out from, you know, the, the big SUV is right here wrecked. And I like pull around it because I'm taking a left into where all this shit went down. <laughs> I'm not about to be a witness to this. And there's like a middle-aged dude that like is fumbling around <laughs> in the white truck. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> and like, oh no, it, it, the situation, you know, you got to appreciate that yeah. he lived, you know, it's all gravy. He fucking opened up his door fumbling around. And flops out of his door on the ground, and he's like bleeding and shit. And uh, I can't Jesus. do a damn thing for him, but I'm like, "Hey, bro, you, uh, you go-? like?" I cracked down my window good? and talked to him, and I was I'm like, not, "I'm not good, bro. I'm hurt." <laughs> and he was like, ah, he was like damn. spitting out blood. And he was like, oh, oh, you know, God. doing stuff like this. And I was like, "Look, I just, he gave me you know, the hands up. He's okay." Yeah, I was like, "Well, I can't do anything for you, bro. Good luck." You need Took some all. milk or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> EMS is uh, arriving shortly. Be all right. Yeah, yeah, the cops are already here, bro. Don't worry about it. You're good. <laughs> but yeah, that was a uh, that was an interesting time for sure. Come on, <laughs> just roll it down a little bit. Like, hey, all right, man. You feeling all right, it's bro? Bleeding out of his mouth. <laughs> oh God. man, let's take a little break and uh, get some refills going here. All right, we got some. Got our refills of our sodies here. Sody pops, and uh, not in any way affiliated or sponsored with said sody pops. But if anybody uh, if you want to. wants to, you know, just hit me up. Yeah, hit me or Mister Savage up. We'll, we'll be a take great it. opportunity. <laughs> anybody but, to sponsor uh, LA Rocks? That'd be fantastic. Oh yeah, this is the time to plug it for show. Sponsor uh, me. Our bases, our strings, for sure. That no, I've be... been trying, man. I really. I would like to get, even if I can get like a a Dunlop, Jim Dunlop sponsorship for my picks. Do they have, is anybody on the team sponsored by it? I don't know necessarily sponsored. I know Drew gets like Vader sticks sent to him that are like pre-signed. Like they sent his signature in. But I don't know if that's directly sponsoring him or if that's like a deal that Dave has worked out with Vader. Because I know uh, Blake was for sure sponsored with him, but I think he got kept in contact with him or something. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Don't quite know much about that. <clears throat> well, on the break, we were talking about cooking a little bit. And uh, I have a story that's going to instantly make you reminisce right here. Oh, here we go. So, also, while I'm thinking about it, we got to talk about how spooktacular your house is. But this, oh, yeah. this about that. particular story happened at his current residence. And this was back whenever we were hanging out, you know, in the height of high octane. And uh, you had been cooking that roast all day. Oh, that well, wait, I know pot. exactly where you're. <laughs> I was trying to think of what story you were talking about. This yeah. when Andre was at the house. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. So he had talked about, like, leading up to this day, we had planned out this hangout set. She was like, all right, bro, we're going to hang out Saturday night. I got this roast. I'm going to marinate. We're going to cook it up. It's going to be fucking good. Had a right. slow cooker for, like, eight hours. Yes. Got there, hanging out, vibing, drinking. You know, it's a good time. Pull the lid off of the crock pot, and it's this beautiful roast and gravy, and it's smelling great. Carrots and we're like, and all right. And just... Life is good. We're like, all right, let's go and serve this delicate dish. And then out of the corner of Andre's eye, he looks up and he sees this fucking big ass cockroach on the wall. Tree roach. Above the pot. Right Uh, above. And then he takes a shoe and smashes this thing and it falls directly into the center. With a nice little... (laughs) little gravy flies out from the pot. We're all just like... (laughs) And I was like, bro, this dish has been cooking too long with too much <laughs> I'm hype. still eating it. I don't like, care. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Scoop it out, throw it away, and serve it up. Uh-uh. I spent too much money and time on that roast to not eat that. It'll be okay. I think it added even a little bit better hey, flavor, yeah. honestly. That's right. Might start doing that shit on purpose now. <laughs> Just toss one in at the end there like a bay leaf, you know? <laughs> You know, uh, I've like desensitized myself on purpose to roaches. Have I told you this? Uh, I can't imagine you haven't, but please. So my wife, I mean, we live in Louisiana. There's fucking roaches everywhere. There's big oh, ass tree you. roaches. Some like a couple in my house over this week. Yay, big! They're pretty gnarly looking. Especially and, if it rains too. They come out of the woodworks. Yeah. And it dawned on me one time because everybody's like natural, you know, inclination is to be like, oh shit, a roach, that's icky. And then they grab a paper towel and smash it or whatever and do away with it. But I was like, man, I grew up doing, you know, fishing and grabbing, you know, you reach your hand into a bucket full of crickets and stuff and they're like worse. They can bite you and they They smell equally. Yeah. And I was like, I I still had that, you know, stigma about the roaches too. You know, you just didn't want to touch them. And I was like, why the fuck is that? Like, I just didn't process. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to grab this roach with my damn bare hands. And so anytime my wife tells me there's a big ass roach somewhere, I've just started grabbing them with my fucking bare hands and throwing them in the toilet. Never so happened. No. Nope. Uh, it, but right, if you think about it, it's like, why? Like, you've probably fished with cockroach or like touched no. weirder creatures no, before, man, I right? I can't say that I have. It's a weird thing, man. I, I am not as country know. as this man is. <laughs> <laughs> the move out here has changed him. <laughs> my brain needs to be scanned. Uh,. <laughs> But yeah, while we're on the subject of your uh, current place you're living at, why don't you tell us about some of the, uh, the hauntings, the spooky activities? Yeah, uh, man, I uh, <laughs> I've never like I don't know. I've always I don't want to say gravitated towards that, but like I've always been interested in it. It's always been something cool to me, and I, you know, did it start with the Beche house? Actually, yeah. Now that I think about it, mm-hmm. I remember at the Beche house we were doing the High Octane album. And I was sitting on the floor. You were doing some guitar stuff. And I was sitting on the floor fooling with something or other. And I remember what felt like somebody walk in front of me. Now, this house is off the ground. It's raised. Old, 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 old house. And I felt the floorboards in front of me, like, sink. Like, somebody was walking in front of me. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't paying attention. I'm thinking somebody's walking. I look up. But I can I can feel the floor moving. And there's nobody in front of me. And it just trails off into the bathroom. Oh my God. And I was just kind of sitting there like... Well, that happened. <laughs> like, how do you how do you react to that? Like, I'm not gonna get up and scream and ah! I mean, it's not gonna I'm not gonna change anything. It's not yeah. gonna change what just happened. So it's like, okay, uh, that happened. <laughs> and I'd heard Jonathan had told us stories and stuff. Um, there was a couple times at the apartment where me and my old roommate had, um, which you wouldn't think. I mean, it's an apartment complex. It's not supposed to be haunted. And now, granted. What you know may like, not have been a haunting. It may have just been like us forgetting to turn a light off and assuming we did, and we look down the hallway and it's still on. Like, but mm. also it's like you know you have a preconceived notion of what haunting right. means, right? right? But like, what it doesn't have to be like necessarily like, like a murder or something that mm-hmm. plants a ghost there. It could be like energy that draws right. things. But to I mean, certain areas, in the house so. that I'm in now is old, like old, old, old. Mm-hmm. The area that I'm in is like old. The Five and Dime on the corner next to my house was built in like mid 1800s or something like that. Like uh, the sorry. railroad is that the railroad tracks across the street from the house are like where the town was built around. The railroad 
is it's still functioning 100 percent, and it's like what 50 feet from your porch yeah i mean like you have my porch my front yard the street and then like a little green space and then there's the tracks like right right there and those conductors slam that throttle down whenever they go through town too you can and hear i mean like them. legally <laughs> push the throttle <laughs> legally they have to like sound the horn at every crossing now the problem with that is if you're standing on my porch there's a crossing there there's a crossing there there's a crossing there there's a crossing there <laughs> dude there's sometimes where those conductors they know they're coming into town and they'll just lay on their horn from the outside of town all the way through yeah, so it's well. just like five minutes of a train non-stop train horse fucking just, dude with his head out the oh, window yeah. just screaming ah! all the time. <laughs> yeah um so the house is very old when i first moved in no, obviously, the last thing you really think about when you move into a place is like, I wonder if this place is haunted. Yeah. So Sometimes the the deal is so good, you don't really give a fuck yeah. if it's haunted or well, not. It's, you know? it's deal so good because it's haunted. <laughs> um, so the first thing that really tripped me out in that house was I had an acoustic guitar propped up in the corner of my living room. Went to bed that night. Um, now, anybody who knows anything about acoustic guitars, like these things are not quiet if you drop one on the floor it's loud Mm -hmm. you know it's a box and that's how it amplifies the sound so i had this thing on a corner stand a little stand in the corner of my room living room and uh i woke up in the morning to get ready for work i go out to turn the kitchen lights on and i notice my guitar is face down on the ground like three or four feet away from the stand and the stand is folded on its side like two feet from where it was originally and I'm kind of standing there thinking, like, how, how did that, like, how does that happen? Yeah. You know, a guitar doesn't just, like, if it falls off the stand, like, I get it if it slides. It slides backwards like that. But this was, it like, somebody picked it up, moved it, and laid it face down, and then folded that little stand up and moved it to the side. And I was like, there's no way in the world that just happened on its own. Yeah. Like, the likelihood of that happening is astronomical. So that was kind of my first little introduction to like weird stuff happening in my house. And then of course, you know, I'd be sitting in the living room watching TV or in the kitchen cooking and you hear a bang in the back of the house and you walk in the guest bedroom and like one of the pictures has fallen off the wall. But like you can, okay, the house is old. It shifts, you know, you can explain that away. But when a picture has been hanging up for, you know, a couple of years at this point, doesn't just like, Oh, that one picture, that one part of the wall shifted, you know, the likelihood not that great. And then um, it escalated to where y'all actually got some people diagnosing it, right? Well, it my somewhere. brother's girlfriend is a professional paranormal investigator, and she came. She was in town in December for Christmas, and him and her came to the house, and they brought like their little toys and tools and stuff. One of them, okay, you have like spirit boxes that like scans just frequencies, kind of like drive-through frequencies or mm-hmm. radio frequencies and all sorts of different stuff. And uh, whole the whole premise is that it's supposed to, you know, that's what spirits use to communicate because they can tap into those frequencies. Um, now theirs was on an iPad, and my brother-in-law was just like, "Oh yeah, look, man, for dollar ninety nine, you can get rid of the ads on here." Like, okay, well, I'm gonna take everything that comes through this with a grain of salt, and we did. And the only things that really came through that were like bugging us out was whenever it said one of our names or said something like intelligent. Like if we asked it a question, it was like, who's in this house? And it's like number three with a mic. You're like, okay, obviously yeah. you know, that's not, <laughs> you know, but like there's nine of us in the house and we're like, well, how many people in the living room? And it's, it's like, it says like nine people. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's, that's intelligent. That's proof that something like specific is specific to y'all. Yeah. It's specific time, to our situation. Yeah. Um, the one thing that freaked me out, it freaked everybody out. She had a music box, just like an old music box, creepy, ding, 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 whatever it is, like ballerina, you open it up and a little ballerina spins. Mm -hmm. There's a motion sensor on the front of that. Um, only like literally only goes off if something passes directly in front of it. So we put that in the kitchen and like we would walk on the other side of the kitchen in front of it and it wouldn't go off, but you walk right in front of it and you move and it starts going off. Um, so we are in the living room around the corner, not in the same room. We're in the living room talking. And I remember at one point I asked, 
you know, if there's any spirits in the house, can you tell us where you are? And the little spirit box thing kept saying corner in the corner. And then at one point it said pizza because we had ordered pizza and we had that music box kind of in the corner of the kitchen sitting on top of the pizza box. So it said corner and then it said pizza. And then five seconds later, that music box started going off oh, in the kitchen. God. When I tell you, we all jumped up and we're like, all right, we're taking a break. We, started, <laughs> we turned all the lights on and everything. We're like, okay, that's enough of that. Oh, well, that gives me like chills just thinking about it. It was that so shit. weird, man. There's been times where like, I'm pretty sure I have some sort of a ghost cat in my house. Cause like even Savannah now, man, we'll be sitting in the, in the, uh, the living room watching TV and you know, cats will, you know, walk up and like rub on your leg when they want affection or whatever, they pass by and they rub on you. Now I've got two cats. So I know, you know, cats will walk by and they'll want affection and everything. But there's been times where I'll feel them rub down by my leg and I'll go to look for them and there's nothing there. And I'm like, where did she go? I'll ask, you know, where'd the cat go? I'm like, they're both outside. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> because she just rubbed <laughs> on my leg. Like I just felt her rub on my leg and there's no cats in the house. Oh shit. I very briefly thought that this house might have had a little bit of spooky activity um because i was there was i guess somewhere around here one of my neighbors had gotten some tannerite or something oh god and i never was like around people shooting tannerite so i never experienced a blast wave you know, the but those, of tannerite yeah those low frequency waves from an explosion that shit some the, and it was like the middle of the day I'm working and then it's like super sudden it sounded like somebody like a 300 pound dude stomped the shit out of the floor like right behind like just me rattles. like stomped it it sounded like somebody just like slammed the fucking floor behind me and I was like holy shit is my house like breaking like is it about <laughs> to like fall down so I'm like running around checking to see I'm like nothing's uh, nothing's off, and then it happened again. I'm like, it, it just out of nowhere, you know. It's like That's so terrifying. crazy, yeah, yeah. So I can't even imagine having some kind of actual spooky shit going down. Other than um, the investigation that we did, the one time that there was proof that something weird, you can call it whatever you want, paranormal or a coincidence. To me, it was paranormal because there's no way this just happens. Mm -hmm. We played Frog Festival in rain. And uh, it was actually Samantha's birthday. So we're, she was, she had been drinking. <laughs> so her sister came into town. We were all hanging out and we had gone to lunch the day before and we had like a huge to go plate of leftover fries. So we're sitting in my, at my breakfast bar in my, lip, my living room, my kitchen. Samantha and I are sitting on one side and her sister's sitting on the other right next to the fridge. Now we're sitting. We're in stools. None of us are getting around. We're not getting up, walking around, moving, shaking the house or anything. We're mid-conversation. We're sitting there snacking. And two things on top of my fridge didn't just like roll, like flew off the top of the fridge. Like flew off the top of the fridge and into the living, into the kitchen. I mean, her sister jumped up and took off running into the living room. And I just sat there with a grin on my face and I'm like, finally somebody else yeah. saw this it's like i'm not crazy this Holy really happens shit. that was probably the third or fourth time that's actually happened i've had i had a little uh my mom got me a little pizza oven like a little betty crocker folding pizza oven thing yeah. for christmas one year and it was sitting on top of the counter and i'm sitting there we're in the kitchen cooking and all of a sudden that thing goes sliding off the counter and flies down into the dining room and just breaks and i'm like oh great cool i use that once <laughs> and it's and it like just, not light no it's like like a 20 pound pizza it's ceramic it's a big ceramic like 16 inch pizza thing uh, like and no it came sliding off my counter nobody was even in that area of the house even if it was like a cat or a, a rat or something that's, no. that's pretty heavy for yeah. something like that for a little cat i mean like obviously you and i could pick it up with one hand and it's no big deal but yeah, i mean like an animal right for a cat to sit there and paw it off and none of the cats were even inside we're both in the kitchen cooking she's sitting at the table i'm standing at the stove and this thing just goes flying off the counter the? and lands on the ground and just breaks in half that is crazy Oh, it's crazy to talk about it, but then to be in the space, knowing like, and you're living in it, right? Yeah. Every day. So then every day is just like, well, what's going to happen today? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to believe this, but I've seen it once, technically twice. I've seen it once and Savannah saw it once, but we've both seen shadows like oh. moving through the house. There was one time where we were getting ready to leave to go somewhere. And I was putting my jewelry on my bracelets on 
and uh, one of them gets a little stuck, so I kind of like hold it with my mouth, and you know, so I'm only looking through like this part of my arm, you know, just kind of like peripheral. Uh huh. And I'm standing in my dining room, in the archway of the dining room, living room, and uh, I see what I thought was Savannah dressed in black, because she was wearing black leggings and a black t-shirt. And I see this black figure walk up to me. And I even like backed up and stepped out of the way because I was getting out of the way of this person walking next to me. And they walk in the living room towards the front door. And so I stuck my head in the living room. I was like, hey, are you ready to go? And I turned and looked in the living room and there's nobody there. And I was like, hey, are you... I was like, what in the hell? And then Savannah comes walking out of the bedroom in the back of the house. Ugh. And I was like, how did you... I was like, you just walked in front of me. And she was like, no, I've been in the bathroom getting ready. And I said, no, no, a black figure just walked right past me. Like I moved out of their way. Oh my God. Like, and then she texted me one day and she said she was petrified because she works at the house. She's in the dining room right now because we don't have an office set up. So where my computer, my computer desk and everything is set up in the dining room, the hallway door is directly to the left, just right there. And she said she was sitting there working and a black shadow just walked from the the hallway just into the kitchen and into the dining room, just like middle of the day. And she just kind of like stood there frozen like, that just happened. Like this, <laughs> so a figure just walked out of the hallway and into the, di- into the, <laughs> the living room. Like... She's got pictures of, she, she used to get up in the morning and like make the bed because she was a stickler for that. Like, you know, bed would be nice and smooth and made out. And she'd get up from her lunch break to go in the bathroom and there's like clearly a spot on the bed where somebody Imprint. had been sitting. Oh, there's like the sheets are just in one spot where somebody God. would be sitting. Yeah. That's I've heard crazy. whispers in like the back of my ear walking down the hallway and everything. Yeah. There's been a couple times that I've been mildly terrified in that house <laughs> but what am i gonna do i'm not leaving yeah it's my house yeah. the price is right my man you just gotta stick yep. it out that's right it's safer <laughs> than some of the apartment complexes where they're shooting each other you know yeah, at so. least they can't hurt me you know it's whatever and that's the thing too like we've talked about it you know it as t- as terrifying as it can be it could be worse you know we're not we're not getting scratched. We're not getting thrown. No knives are flying off the counters yet. You know? Yeah. Like nothing. Ha- it hasn't felt negative until, oh, until we did that investigation and we kept asking the spirits about who was in the house. And, uh, there were two names. I don't remember the woman's name, but there were two spirits, like distinct spirits. I should say one was a woman who came through and seemed very friendly and that's the other thing too. Like Savannah will smell perfume in the house. That's not hers randomly. And like, she'll feel like, you know, air blowing on her ear, but it's always comes off as playful. The figure, the shadow we saw on the other hand is a little bit different. It's not, it doesn't feel dangerous, but it doesn't feel friendly either. Uh-huh. And we kept getting distinctly the name Nicholas kept, kept coming through. I know this was on YouTube, so you may have to censor all this, but he kept saying Nicholas, and rape just Uh, repeatedly, you know? So those two, so we know there's a female spirit. That's not that bad, but we know there's a male spirit that probably isn't the nicest person. (laughs) He might be a rapist. Yeah. Probably something (laughs) like that. Yeah. Damn. That's Um, fucking crazy. Yeah. I wonder if you could like, have you tried researching like the history? I've tried. I can't find anything. I'm not saying there's not. I'm sure there is because, yeah. I mean, the house itself wasn't built in the 1800s. It was probably built in the 70s. I don't know. Maybe. I have no idea. Still Could enough, have been built in the early 1900s for all I know. Enough time to have uh, history for yeah. sure. And I mean, even even if it's not the house, like the land and the area around that. I mean, you think about people that died building the railroad tracks or building the city from, yeah. you know, rain's been around since the early eight, or sorry, mid-1800s, you know. Man, it's a long bonkers. time for people to have been there and died and... Yeah, so pretty tight. Well, let's segue stuff. into the uh, the the topic that I usually hit people with if I know that they're into it. Food. Games. Oh. oh well, we can hit the <laughs> we can hit. Well, actually, yeah, let's do the food thing. So food we can games. It. Let's do. So we talked about the one thing you cooked that had the story, but do you have a preferred dish that you'd like to cook? Man, right now I am stuck on this recipe that. Savannah's grandpa used to make, and it's so simple. It's literally just Italian sausage with bell peppers, onions, and mushrooms. That's it. 
And it, but man, oh, I could eat that like three times a week. Do you put it over like pasta or you just? Uh, well, eat it? we eat it over rice. You can eat it. I think he used to serve it on like hoagies or like po' boy buns or whatever. It's like but a, I've been eating it over rice, dude. It's, it's so good. You just all we do is just brown that sausage a little bit, and then you chop in your pel pepper, bell peppers, pel peppers, pel peppers <laughs> onions, and mushrooms. And I've been. I got on a shallot kick, man. I've been just using yeah. shallots for everything now. So I did that the other night. I used two onions and some shallots with peppers. And I forgot the mushrooms. Were you supposed to add mushrooms? But I saute all of that in like the brown from the uh, from the sausage. Damn. And then throw the sausage back in that. And I add a little bit of chicken stock to kind of make a little bit of a gravy. And you serve that over it, rice. It's oh, like a thicker gravy? Kind of thinner. Interesting. And you probably could make it thicker, but it's I don't really think it's supposed to have a gravy because like I said, he used to serve it on apparently used to serve it on like you know, hot dog buns or hoagie buns or whatever. Yeah, it sounds like an Italian uh Philly cheesesteak type yeah, thing. Yeah, sort of. That's tight. It's so freaking good. In fact I did that the first time we ever made it, I was like, I'm melting cheese all over this, obviously. Yeah. Oh my god, dude. I'm obsessed with that dish right now. I have I'm almost about to dig it out of the freezer. I might have some extra of that breakfast sausages that I had made not too long ago. And uh, it was made with like Italian seasonings. So if I have some extra packs, of that, I'll give you some of that shit. That so you so can, good, man. You might get hit it up with that. Yep. Dang. That's good stuff. That's tight, man. So then, video games. Video games. Do you have an all-time favorite game? Or it doesn't even have to be all-time. Yeah, what is all your all-time, no. I can't... I know it's hard. It's like bands, but like yeah, I mean, genre wise, like almost thirty five years old, like all time favorite. Video. There's been a lot of video games in our, yeah, right. our life, you know. Which one are you currently hitting? I know you said uh, No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky, dude. I have I. That's one of those games where like, and you were there for the release of that game was like the expectations were so high. It turned and I into a it's meme. So good, like <laughs> yes, man. I can't wait. And you get it. And it's just like. Nope, there's actually nothing in this game. <laughs> it's about exploration, but like you're just exploring nothing. Oh, there's nothing so to great. explore. It's awful. And then they turned around and just had like the best, you know, turnaround of all video game history. Yeah. And now, man, with the updates and everything they've put out, I started playing again. And nobody else that I knew played it, so I finally got my friend Chris Aber. Remember Chris Aber? He, uh, I was like, dude, you have to get this game. Like he had it for PS4, and we got the PS5, and when he got the digital version, so he had the disc version of No Man's Sky, so we couldn't play it anymore. He's like, I don't want to buy the game again, you know? I was like, oh, it's on sale. It's on sale right now, and it's ten times the game that it was when we first bought it. Like, you have to trust me. He's like, uh-huh. Had to convince him. Finally, I was just like, I'm buying it for you, bro. Here. So I just sent him the money, got the game, and dude, when I tell you, it's been like a month of just every day if I have any spare time, like that's all I'm doing is just playing. That. Really, I cannot stop playing that game. Damn, let's take. They were like uh, about to release the mech suits or some shit. Whenever I had stopped Good playing, Lord, honestly, it's been, right? <laughs> there's been, it's like, been like a year or two, four or updates least, or something yeah. since then. Damn, that's yeah, tight. There's a whole lot in that game, and like, like I said, I've been playing that game nonstop for weeks, and I'm still just kind of like scratching or getting to like the bottom layer of that first surface layer. Damn. It's, yeah. It's almost too much in the game. Like the base building is it got like really updated and that's what I was enjoying cuz you can like uh to make money I was like going and snagging like those rare plants yep. and then making the materials out of all I that. I make all, all the money I make in that game is just like doing uh, like bounty hunting. You can really? be a pirate but like I just go and hunt the pirates instead of being the pirate. You go and get the contracts for it and then ah that's tight. Oh yeah. See so it's, a, it's like Elite Dangerous in that sense. Yeah. But there's more. Like, you can land anywhere and get out and build anywhere and harvest and all that kind of stuff. And you make good money with the bounty stuff. See, that oh, yeah. was the thing with Elite Dangerous. Elite Dangerous was, like, before No Man's Sky. And it was more of, like, a flight simulator mixed with, yeah, like, like, space, space type shit. And uh, I really enjoyed it. But there was, like, one particular bucket that, like... If you, you wanted to make money, you had to subscribe to the mining shit. And mining was fun, but it's like, it, it gets should have been... repetitive and kind of boring after a while, you know? Yeah, it should have been balanced to where, like, exploration and 
bounty hunting was also lucrative. Like you should be able to make the same amount of money doing yeah. other things. Yeah, it's not like yeah. they couldn't have like tweaked, you know, yeah. the code just a little bit to make that yeah. happen. But but that's what No Man's Sky, man. Like you can do all of those things. You can do the farming, and while your stuff is, you know, growing and harvest and getting ready for harvest, you can go and, p- and bounty hunt. So you or expeditions and stuff with the um with the farming and the base building and all that stuff you end up building different things to cater to you know growing or doing whatever you want to make money with that with the bounty hunting do you have to add any kind of modules or anything specific to your ship to increase how much money or like your well uh, your efficiency of like bounty hunting you can install like a conflict scanner on there's different scanners like an uh, an economy scanner so if you want to do just trading yeah you can install the economy scanner and like your hauler and it'll show you like that's you know, this one is is you know geared towards this and this system's geared toward this and blah blah blah. Is that newer? Because I don't remember that being. I think yeah, I think it's I one of the. Playing. I say newer. I mean, yeah, within a year or two. Yeah, of, a couple, uh... yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the conflict scanner will show you when you go into your galaxy map and you select a star system. It'll tell you like it'll it'll show a little combat system and like a one two three or a skull, and some are like pirate controlled systems. So if you warp into that, chances are. You're going to warp into like a pirate battle and that's, you can get freighters now too. So you have like your freighters and all your frigates and everything and you can send those on expedition. So it's, it's almost like an idle game in a sense that like you send them out and then you don't worry about it for a day or two yeah. and you come back and you've made half a million bucks and some rare resources because yeah, your team that you've put together is out doing their own thing. I think I had like started dabbling in the trading thing too because that's whenever I was like, okay, well, they were like, there's some things where you could show it showed you where you like buy things from a certain system and sell higher. Yeah, that's just tight. Yeah, man. If you ever get back on that game, that's me and Chris have like a compound that we've built because now you can build bases with each other. That was one thing that yeah, kind of bugged me. Yeah, we tried doing that yeah. and it wasn't working It bugged at me because it was like, oh, the host can build and everybody else can just interact with it. It was like, well, what's the, that's not multiplayer. That's just host, yeah. you're hosting a game and your friends can just see what yeah. you've done. Like, that's dumb. But it's gotten to the point now where like I can give permissions to you, for you to come in and build on this base. So like I have my, we, we found this really cool planet that's like this paradise planet. And we have this, it's like a, like a cove almost with the water and everything. And he built his compound on one side. I built mine on the other. And then in the lake, there was this little island. So we built like a power station. We built this little building and just stuffed it full of like solar panels and biofuel reactors and all that kind of stuff. And then connected with wires to each of our base. So now we have power that's just generating from this power station out in the water. Just like tons of power all the time. Um, And then we have like roads that we've built connecting each other's bases and everything. It's, it's awesome. So there's, there's like a meaning to the roads. Like it's a fast travel. Well, the roads really are just, they're really cosmetic, but you can get um, like exocraft. Like there's a little buggy, it's like a little race car looking thing. There's one that's like a hover car. There's a giant hauler tank now Damn. that you can get. There's the mech you can get. Um, and I mean, really, like I said, they're really just cosmetic and it, it makes it look cooler. Yeah. But you can drive that car on that road to your friend's base or whatever and then go use his resources that you don't have. So like he has a galactic trade terminal in his base where you can sell things. I don't. Yeah. So instead of just building one, like, eh, whatever, I'll just drive my little car over to his base and sell everything I need from his terminal. That's tight. Yeah. So you can build, like, a tank. Are there enemies big enough to, like, warrant the use of a tank or a mech suit? <sighs> the, the mech suit and the tanks and stuff, I haven't really messed with that too much. I don't think they're really used for combat as much as they are exploration and, and like, resource harvesting. Ah, uh, okay. Like, we found this one planet that's... <laughs> it's, uh... God, what are they? It's it's a scorched planet. It's so close to the sun, and this is what's great about this game too. Like it almost takes like astrophysics into account. Yeah. So like the closer the, the planet is to the sun, the hotter it is. So this planet that we're on is so close to the sun, and it's so small that like every eight minutes, there's what's called the wall of flame. So like it basically, whenever if we're on this side of the planet and it rotates into the sun, it's just the solar rays and the heat is just scorching the planet while it rotates and then it stops. Oh, but what's man, cool about that is that those planets will have extra rare resources. What's called storm crystals, the risk and it's reward these, system. Yeah. So we built this like little base where we house our mechs, 
So when the storm comes around, you hop in your mech and you go out and you collect these crystals that only show up when the storms come about. Oh, like during it. Yeah, during the storm. Wow. So like your shield is just like, if you get out, your shield just goes <laughs> and you, you'll die like that if you don't have the right stuff. Damn. But you can only get those crystals and they're worth like 200000 a piece. So I mean, that's what me and Chris do. We'll sit there and, you know, every eight minutes for a minute and a half or so, you go and collect these crystals and in 90 seconds, you've collected like $3.6 million worth of stuff. And there's Damn. a trade terminal right there. So you go and sell it. You get in your base and you wait. <laughs> it's almost broken, dude. It's ridiculous. Ah, that's awesome. It's fun, though. So, I mean, we... And I think he texted me one morning, and he was like, all right, I'm getting ready to harvest some crystals. And, like, two hours later, he was sitting at, like, 50 million something. Damn, that's tight. Yeah, See, that's that's kind of how it was with Elite. Um, once I figured out, like, you can do the bounty hunting. And the bounty hunting is, like, very engaging. And mm-hmm. they did make an effort to make the uh, mining more engaging. Yeah. And... Uh, that's where it was. It was like you could go to these areas and there was like... It actually inspired one of the mechanics that I've used in several of the games that I've created. is like scanning an asteroid field. And then you can... Like the different ones that have a higher mineral concentration will light up. And then you'll know, okay, that's the one that I need to hit. And then you go and then you're uh, charging up like explosives to a certain threshold and there's like a meter that's building up and there's like a sweet spot and I've I've used that mechanic in a handful of games now but you hit the asteroid with a handful of charges with that charged up you know into the sweet spot and mm-hmm. then that affects the yield of how much mineral you get once you crack the asteroid open and it was the same thing it's like you go to these like super you know you got a scan farm and all that shit but once you get there and you crack these asteroids open it's like you know millions Mm -hmm. you know you come back and like before they did all the mining updates it would be like you know you'd be lucky if you were making it was it was the uh passenger missions so you would try and get oh yeah you you would you could get different ships outfitted towards like you know if you were doing trading or combat but then there were some that you could outfit with a lot of space for like passengers and so i'd get like a big airliner looking thing the spaceship. Beluga. Yeah, and fucking like get as many high profile I remember pe- those. passengers as I could and then you'd go across and you'd basically just be traveling from hub to hub and you'd mm-hmm. be lucky if you made like 10 mil an hour and then versus like mining where you'd make like 250 mil an hour in yeah. one run. Unbelievable. And then there's always that added bonus of if, if there's any uh, players out there that you know have played Elite Dangerous and the mail slot entrance and exit on the damn spaceports. I had a... Uh, <laughs> Don't you dare hit the wall, bro. Don't come in too fast like either. I had, I had like just... I hadn't, I hadn't played in a while and I got back into it and I picked up a mission. I forgot how rough it is if you have a big ass ship to exit without like autopilot going on. And I, I was fumbling my controls and I couldn't figure out which button was just like, you know, to put the landing gear up and I accidentally hit the boost. <laughs> no! inside the damn station oh, no. with a beluga which is a huge ass Massive. ship so you thread the needle to leave that thing yeah like the the mail i call it the mail side because it's like this big and your ship is like this big so then you're trying like not only are you trying to make it through just left and right but up and down like you're just sliding through this fucking interest so if you're not doing it cool and collective you'll smoke the top of this thing and they immediately come after you yeah that. like you'll bu- you'll horribly injure your ship and there's other sh- big ass ships coming through this thing and if you hit them then you're you're like the st- now you're a criminal yeah the station it treats you as a criminal and then they'll start shooting at you and shit so i like accidentally hit the boost and ended up like trying to pull up and just smoke this other big ass ship coming through and like complete it got me down to like <laughs> No shields and like five percent hull oh, no. to like start the journey with all these high profile He's individuals got the on board. And, all his cabinet members. <laughs> and right when I go outside because I hit that other ship, all of the antibody fucking like other ships that are security just blew security me the fuck up. Just takes them out. I don't care about your political leaders. You ran into the, the station wall. You should know better than that fucking jawbone spinning out of control and on fire in space for eternity from that explosion <laughs> political <laughs> delegates just floating away uh, yeah man 
some good times playing video games. I remember we used to play the shit out of Bad Company 2, my boy. <laughs> the No Sense 2000. <laughs> the shotgun that you could oh, snipe people across the map God. with. You just put this 12-gauge slug on that gun and it was impossible <laughs> to miss. <laughs> If you could see their name in the distance, you just leveled right under that name, and that's it. Five hundred yard shot, stupid with thing. a shotgun. It made no sense, was and it was literally called the NS two thousand. <laughs> no sense. We uh, back whenever we were like in the early days of the band days, you know, whenever we didn't, our jobs weren't as pressing, and life was simpler. We would he'd come over to my house, or I'd go to his house, and we'd do the land party type shit, playing God, that. I miss that man. It was like Medal of Honor, right? That oh one, yeah, Medal of Honor was good. We played that one, and then Battlefield Bad Company two. We spent too much time on that game. It was so good. It and like we, I think was it bad? Was it a uh, Battlefield three that came after that, or Battlefield four? It was Battlefield 3 after that. Three, That's what yeah. we played. So then we, you know, Battlefield 3 didn't have as much like bullet drop off physics. And overall, it just felt like Bad Company 2 was better. But man, we played the I loved, fuck out of that game. We used to play the hardcore mode for Bad Company 2 and just <laughs> stand next to the chopper. And whenever somebody would spawn in the chopper, just take them out. <laughs> just team kill our own people. <laughs> And then uh, we started getting killed by people. It was like a sniper that people treated as like an uh, like a what was it? The Asval or something? Burst fire, yeah. fucking uh, assault rifle. Yeah, and we we're like, how are these people killing us with this sniper rifle like this? But it was a burst fire. If you use it as a sniper rifle, it was shit. But if you took the scope off, it just had like iron sights You're and like a, a magnum sight round a suppressor or something. Yeah. yeah, just roll up and just devastating. Like, spray somebody down up close. So good. Man, we used to, used to get me so pissed off at that game because you'd play the medic and like you run out <laughs> into the battle and like revive somebody and they'd get shot and you'd revive them again. Like it's just points. That was Battlefield Three. Oh yeah, I oh remember that my shit. God, There'd be dude. like areas where you could have there. You know, in general, the the best parts of those games is like it's a dynamic thing. Have you never know where, where you know each game each round is different and there's like 20 people on each team and then they end up getting into a space where there's just the whole team versus the other whole team and there's like fighting over this hallway so they're just throwing grenades into the <laughs> smoke and shooting into this shit any mentally sound medic would not be reviving people <laughs> yeah. in this cheese grater of a hallway <laughs> so he would be like in the middle of it where there's like obvious they're spraying him down and I would just be like hitting him over and over and it would just keep reviving Stop him. Stop reviving me. I got no ammo left. I'm just like barren on all my resources. And he's like, oh nah, God. man, my points are just skyrocketing. I will shock this quivering pile of meat back to life as many times as I can. Uh, that was good times. I miss that game. I wish they would come out with Bad Company 3, man. So good, yeah. They teased with that for too long. And then they gave us Battlefield 2042, which is just a... Heaping Remake. pile of crap. <laughs> Which is like, it's fun if you can play it for like one or two rounds, but like, I hate how these game developers are developing games like that specifically for streamers. Ah, yeah. Because yeah. it's just like, oh, that man jumped out of a, a jet and blew somebody up with a rocket launcher. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't play Battlefield <laughs> for like the hyper sci fi realism or hyper sci fi non realism. Like, or, uh, all I play the- that kind of stuff because, like, I want to know, like, Battlefield 4, man, if you were at a distance, you had to know that bullet's going to drop and it's going to yeah. travel a certain, you know, distance. Yo. This one is basically just Call of Duty, man, like a laser shot. And you can jump out of a helicopter and ride on the top of a helicopter while it's flying. Like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> or the uh, Battle Royale type. Games, yeah, everybody's going battle royale. And I'm so sick and tired of that. It was cool for a little market, bit, yeah, with a PUBG microtransaction and Fortnite, which is like, man, I had I had my fun playing Fortnite, especially when they got the whole zero build. Like, there is no more. I mean, no, you, you still can't play, hurry up like, and build a wall. You can't in front build of the Taj you. Mahal if somebody takes a shot at you. <laughs> so it's almost like you have to actually be skilled at a shooter to play that game. And then even then, they started adding like. You can fly now and shoot laser beams and throw lightning bolts. I'm like, okay, well, it was fun for a little bit. Now I'm just done. You could turn into Dr. Manhattan and just yeah, basically evaporate just... people. And then even Battlefield tried to do the whole Battle Royale thing, and it was just uh, trash. Yeah. Like, let it go. Not every 
shooter has to have a battle royale mode. <laughs> you can just keep your core mechanics at what they are and just roll with that. Cashing in on that shit. Uh, well, microtransaction. We're getting towards the end of it. Is there any last words you want to tell the audience right here? Be savage, not average. Words to live by. You got any shows coming up or anything you want yeah, to tell man. people about um, them? The next couple of weeks, we've got uh, Beaumont. We have a lot more than this. I'm just drawing a blank right now. I'll post the... Uh, you got a, like, a link to... Uh, yeah, I'll where? send you a link to the schedule. Right. I know June, man. We have like every weekend in June. We've got something going on from Toledo Bend... We've got Winnifield, Louisiana. I've never played. It's like apparently like three thousand people that live there are playing this Dudge Mona festival. If I'm saying that right, I don't. I don't know if I am or not. <laughs> they never play, heard of that before. They play in the pier in Cameron Parish. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have. We're doing a private party in Toledo Bend somewhere, and then we have Dudge Mona festival, and then we're doing um, Kima. They have like basically like rhythms on the river, but they do it like on the water type of thing. Oh, at the, at the Kima Boardwalk, we're doing that Thursday night, and the next day we have Rock and Bowl, and we're hopefully, man. I mean, we were planning on doing it earlier, but you know, life and things happened. Yeah. But I think August we we're trying. And let me not <laughs> promise anybody anything. We're trying. We're trying to have our album release party in August, oh, if we can. Shit. But it's a very big if. God, we didn't even talk. I mean, yeah, next time really we get this man on, we will talk about it because now he's talking about it, the, the makings of it. By the next time, it'll probably have been released so we can hear the yeah, success hope, story. Yeah, hopefully, of it. then we'll actually, I can, I, you can give a sample or like run yeah. a track on here and you can hear what it sounds like because uh, it's, it's, it's done. It's just now we're working on like the artwork and the album cover and the booklet on the inside and the CD cover and stuff. So. Yeah, that's badass. Yeah, man. So. Well, tight, man. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been a blast. It's been fun, man. Peace out, everybody.